Well, good evening and welcome everyone. I now call to order the August 24th, 2020 York County School Board regular meeting. And once again, we're meeting remotely, uh, virtually. As I stated many times prior, I'd like to thank again our IT department, our video services for their assistance in this meeting preparation and everything they do for us. Um, so now I'm gonna do the roll call. I just need each board member to now state their remote location. So we're gonna start with Mr. Higginbotham. Yes, 111 Ivy Arch, Yorktown, Virginia, 23693. Okay, Ms. Geralt. 100 Leanne Court, Yorktown, Virginia, 23692. Great, Mr. Schaefer. Yes, 115 Catawba Court, Williamsburg, Virginia, 23185. All right, Mr. Myatt. 105 Kiskiak Turn, Yorktown, Virginia, 23693. And I'm James Richardson. I'm at 710 Ship Point Road, Yorktown, Virginia, 23692. So on June the 16th, 2020, the York County Board of Supervisors readopted ordinance number 20-11R addressing the continuity of operations during COVID-19 pandemic and allowing for continuation of remote real-time electronic meetings of this board. Therefore, all board members are participating in this meeting remotely through electronic communications. So pursuant to the school board resolution that was passed, 20-19 authorizing board meetings through electronic communication without a physically assembled quorum and in compliance with York County Ordinance 20-11R during the pendency of Ordinance 20-11R and COVID-19 pandemic emergency. We are streaming live video of our regular meeting through the Division YouTube channel and the YCSD TV. This is a challenging time and the board appreciates all the effort that's been put in by every employee in the division and more especially our teachers, our principals, and our leaders at our school board office. Uh, I know they've been working feverishly over the last uh, several weeks, and especially this last week has been very trying, I know, for them to try to work the schedules out and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but there have been many long hours put in, and it's obvious everyone's here for one reason, the education of our children. And I want to thank you for, for everything you've been doing. The board wants to thank you. So I'll now read the YCSD mission statement. The mission statement of the YCSD, the York County School Division is to engage all students in acquiring the skills and knowledge needed to make productive contributions to the world. Now, I'd like to mention also that our meeting agenda documents are available by logging on to board docs via our YCSD website at yorkcountyschools.org. Next, I'd like to share some information on our pledge leader this evening and our pledge leader is Evelyn Rocklet. She's a first grade student at Coventry Elementary School. So Evelyn will be the first grade student this fall and is the daughter of a Coventry teacher. Evelyn loves school and is an, is an, an academic and social role model for all of her peers. She contributes positively to her classroom and Coventry communities and meets our pause positive behavior expectations, which is practice safety, act responsibly, work hard, and show respect. In her free time, Evelyn enjoys reading and dancing and playing board games with her family. She participates in Taekwondo classes at World Martial Arts, and Evelyn has earned her purple belt in Taekwondo and will be testing for her blue belt very soon. Coventry Elementary is proud to have El Elvin Evelyn Rocklick represent us as our pledge leader this month. Good evening, Mr. Richardson and Dr. Shandor. My name is Evelyn Yaklik and I am a first grade student at Coventry Elementary School. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bye. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Evelyn. That was perfect. Loved it. So now we're going to move into our recognitions part of our, our meeting and introduction of new staff. Dr. Shandor, I'll let you share comments about our staff members. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Good evening, board members. Um, I want to share a few comments related to the newest additions to our YCSD leadership team. So um, there's five of them. So we'll start off with Ms. Christy Morgan. 
Associate Director of Student Services. Ms. Morgan has been with the division since 2002 and has served as a special ed teacher, department chair, and an ACC. Since 2013, Chrissy Christy has served as the coordinator of student services. Next, we have Ms. Katie Gaylord, coordinator of K-12 school counseling. Ms. Gaylord has served as a school counselor at Waller Mill Elementary since 2005 and as the elementary school counseling lead since 2014. Over the past year, she served as the division's K-12 school counseling lead. Next, we have Ms. Christine Swanson, Yorktown Middle School assistant principal. Ms. Swanson served as a lead math teacher and secondary math instructional coach with the Newport News Public Schools. Since 2014, she has served as an assistant principal at Mary Passage Middle School. Next, we have Ms. Heather Kennedy, Bethel Manor Elementary School assistant principal. Ms. Kennedy started her career in education in Chesapeake Public Schools as a special ed teacher at the elementary and secondary levels. Since 2016, Ms. Kennedy has served as the K-12 assistant principal in Charles City Public Schools. And finally, we have Ms. Megan King, Dare Elementary School Assistant Principal. She started um, midway through the year last year. She came to us from Hampton City Schools, began serving in her, her new role since uh, last October. She began her career as a first grade teacher in 2010 before transitioning to the role of Title I Reading Interventionist. Ms. King served the last two years as a Title I Literacy, literacy Support Specialist. We welcome all these YCSD leaders and are fortunate to have them as part of our team. Thank you, so, Dr. And go ahead. So our next item um, that I'll share a little bit of information about, um, on June 18th, 2020, the Virginia Board of Education recognized 447 schools across the state, including nine York County school divisions, school, schools in our division. For high, for high student achievement, continuous improvement or innovative practices under the board's exemplar performance school recognition program. The awards are based on performance and practice during the 2018, 2019 and prior years. Tab Elementary School was one of 71 schools that earned the Board of Education highest achievement honor. To earn the award, a school must earn a state accreditation rating of, a, of, of accredited and demonstrate high levels of success across all school quality indicators, including success in narrowing achievement gaps. So congratulations to all of our staff members at Tab Elementary. While Bethel Manor Elementary, Dare Elementary, Grafton Middle School, Magruder Elementary, Queens Lake Middle School, Tab High School, York High School, and York River Academy all received the Board of Education Continuous Improvement Award. These are schools that are recognized for continuous improvement, were rated as accredited for 2019-2020, and met at least one of four criteria identified by the state based on performance during the 2018-2019 school year. So again, congratulations to all of the staff and students in these buildings for achieving this recognition. And I have one final item here. Tonight, we're also excited to recognize seven staff members who recently completed the second cohort of the York County School Division's leadership program. This leadership program called LEAD, Leading, Empowering, Aspiring, and Developing, was developed to help support goal three of the strategic plan, which aims to recruit, support, and retain high quality leaders. The program offers professional development and mentoring support through hands-on learning experiences led by division leadership staff. The program included the following. Um, this group met monthly to study the five practices found in the leadership challenge framework. Guest presenters shared how they applied the five practices of leadership in their role within the school division. And I want to acknowledge them right now. Dr. Aaron Butler, uh, Mr. Paul Rice, Ms. Kelly Denny, Ms. Heather Young, Bill Bowen, and Ms. Jennifer Goodwin. They all served as uh, role models for the division related to the five practices, again, of the leadership challenge. Also, each participant then selected a personal best project that they planned and implemented utilizing what they learned in the LEAD program. So I'll introduce those participants to you right now. Um, first, we have Ms. Maria Bird, 
who's a licensure specialist in our HR department. Ms. Francis Devon, coordinator of student services. Next, we have Mr. Anthony Friedman, who's a, an assistant principal at Tab Elementary School. Mr. Jeffrey Gaylord, assistant principal at Magruder Elementary. Ms. Ebony Griffin, assistant principal at Yorktown Elementary. Mr. Todd Miller, assistant principal at Mount Vernon Elementary. And finally, we have Ms. Beth Welch, assistant principal at Walla Mill. Really proud of this group, um, especially given the circumstances that we've been in under the past, obviously six, seven months of this group of individuals stayed the course, worked really hard, and I'm proud of the work that they've accomplished. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. And I look forward to hearing about the contributions and the insight uh, from these leaders uh, that what they'll bring to our division. So we congratulate each one of them. Thank you so much. So next we have on our business meeting, we have uh, no unfinished business. So we're gonna move on to capital projects report and Dr. Shandor, I'll let you share comments. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. I'm now gonna turn the, this presentation over to Mr. Mark Shearhart, Associate Director for um, Capital uh, Programs and all of our construction, Mr. Shearhart. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Shandor. This evening, I will be reviewing four capital projects the Dare Elementary School Breezeway Enclosure, Coventry Elementary School HVAC Replacement, Tab High School Security Vestibule, and the Grafton Complex HVAC Replacement. The first project is the Dare Elementary School Breezeway Enclosure, which is 100% complete. Here's what the building looked like back in February, and here is what it looks like today. This is a picture of the interior of the breezeway looking from back to front. In front of you on the right is a ramp for ADA access. Behind the doors on the left are a small breakout space for small group instruction and a small conference room. The wide hallways and whiteboards installed on the hallway walls provide space for informal soft seating and small group instruction. Next, we have the Coventry Elementary School HVAC project. This project went very well. The contractor rapidly removed and replaced the classroom ceilings, light fixtures, and HVAC systems and gave the classrooms a fresh new look. Here's what the classrooms look like in the middle of June. And here's what they look like today, clean and polished with the furniture being moved back in. Here are two of the new heat pumps at Coventry Elementary School we were able to replace 15 standard heat pumps with just three high efficiency variable flow refrigerant heat pumps. The next project is the Tab High School security vestibule. This project was necessary to provide a security vestibule for our Tab High while not blocking the normal flow of tra student traffic through the building. Walls, carpet, and floor tile were removed and new walls constructed. Electrical and ductwork changes were made and a new ceiling was installed. New paint, carpet tiles, doors, and a new counter were added to create an inviting new entrance for visitors and students. While this was a small project, there were many trades involved in a very small space. Each tradesperson had to work within a tight schedule to get their work completed in the correct order. There were some difficult, difficult changes with the demolition, but in this slide, you can see that they have turned the corner and started construction and even painting. And here is what the new visitor and attendance office looks like, minus the computers, of course. Here is the new security vestibule you can see the entrance to the new visitor and attendance office on the right-hand side. As we back out of the building, you'll see here on the left is the existing door A2 that leads into the new security vestibule. Note that it is on the left-hand side before you get to the old main entrance. The intercom will be, be relocated from the old entrance to the new visitor and attendance entrance. As we back out still further, you can see where the new entrance is in relation to the commons area at Tab High School. The last project this evening 
is the second phase of the Grafton Complex HVAC project, the middle school lighting and HVAC replacement. The contractors have been very busy at Grafton Complex on the middle school side of the building and in the high school area, high school band area. The electricians have been replacing light fixtures while the HVAC technicians have been dismantling, removing, and replacing heat pumps, piping, ductwork, and other equipment. This is a picture of what the third floor mechanical space of the middle school looked like after all the heat pumps and some of the ductwork had been removed. And here is a picture of the same area with the new heat pumps and ductwork being installed. In this picture, the contractors are installing a new HVAC unit on the roof of the high school band room. In the band room, new ductwork and a ceiling grid, new ductwork and ceiling grid have been installed in this picture. And here the band room installations are 100% complete. This is my last slide for this part of the presentation. Do you have any questions for me? Dr. Carroll will be covering the rest of the presentation. Do you guys have any questions for Mr. Sherhart related to what he presented? No, I don't have any. Okay. All right, Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. So if we can return to the uh, presentation. We're gonna talk about other things at Grafton that we're all aware of. So the first is the fire restoration, which you know uh, started in February, I think February 3rd. So uh, here's your update as we come to the close of all those repairs. So all power panels have re been uh, replaced in the building. Permanent power is now available throughout the building. We've removed all the damaged lighting and the last damaged light fixtures are being replaced in the middle school atrium. And uh, some of that work was a delay due to the remediation that had to happen midsummer. Contractors are replacing the damaged heat pump fan motors we had to replace a good number of those. We're now down to about 35 that have not been replaced. Um, we, we have good air moving through the building right now, but we're still short 35. And also accompanying wiring harnesses that are being shipped separately. So that's been an interesting pattern. Both of those being delayed due to COVID uh, related delays from the factories. So uh, they've been coming in very sporadically through the summer. Here you see the, the final uh, switchboard completely installed. This was a picture taken on August 20th, and you can see that it's all, all ready uh, to go. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to the mold remediation that became a factor. Uh, the, everything has been cleaned, tested, and cleared out of the middle school classrooms and media centers. Uh, we have now started uh, starting up the middle school uh, air conditioning equipment as of, I believe, the 19th, <clears throat> we have uh, cleaned, tested, and cleared the high school band room and started up the new band room air conditioning system on the 19th also. Workers are now in the print, uh, process of, of the last bit of work in the gyms, the Kiva, the auditorium, and the kitchens. And that is, I believe, at this point, everything is clean and we're waiting for testing to come back. Uh, the contractor has been backing out of the building, starting the air conditioning systems as we've gotten clear signs, and uh, they plan to be out of the building uh, at the end of the 25th so that on the 26th they were clear to go. Oh, I think we have two more pictures. We had a, uh, we had to bring in a large temporary air conditioning system at the beginning of the remediation to bring the temperatures and humidity down in order to uh, stop the mold progression. And now you, um, and so that is now removed or is in the last stages of being removed. And then these are examples of how we cordoned off uh, parts of the building so that we could do compartmentalize it, clean it in stages, test in stages, and turn air conditioning on in stages. Uh, so that's it for the mold remediation. So to recap the whole project, the high school is in good shape. It's all powered up and all clean. Uh, Two thirds of a, uh, heat pumps are now installed and we're still waiting on those COVID related delays, but air is moving through the building well. The fire, fire alarm is good and teachers are able to report to the high school side now. 
Middle school will be getting their final electrical inspection tomorrow. 95% of those brand new uh, heat pumps are uh, operating and they're being checked and commissioned and doing some final tune up work on them. We will have administration moving into the middle school side on Wednesday, teachers in on Thursday. And uh, this project that has taken, uh, what not, uh, five and a half months is now nearing completion in the next couple of days. And that's the end of my report. Okay, any questions of uh, Mr. Carroll? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank Dr. Carroll. Mr. Shearhart and Mr. Carroll, or Dr. Carroll. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Shandor. No, I, I just said thank you to Dr. Carroll for those that presentation. Gotcha. All right, next we're going to move into our public participation at board meetings. Uh, the criteria used for sharing public comments, I'll read that. Um, this information was posted on our Facebook page. Uh, it was posted on the division website um, in the news section, and they were, you were, it was put out that the meeting would be live streamed on YouTube and YCSD TV. So per school board policy, public comment will be accepted as part of the meeting. Citizens can address the board by leaving a recorded voicemail at the following number. It was 757-833-7127. Beginning at noon on Thursday, August 20th, the public comment phone line will close at 2 p.m. And to provide public comment, you would call that number between the hours of two, uh, 12 and 2 on Thursday, August 20th. 2020, you would state your name, your address, followed by comments addressed to the school board. And the school board rules and procedure allow for one comment per person and maybe no more than three minutes in length with no more than 30 minutes total allocated for the comments. This 30 minute period may be extended by the chair's discretion. The chair reserves discretionary authority to rule the speaker out of order. Now we're gonna play our three comments. The last comment I understand is cut off at the end. We're not sure if the individual disconnected or hung up, but, or they, I, I believe it was a, um, they had hit the three minute mark anyway. Um, so it, it does cut off after the three minutes automatically. But we're gonna play our th uh, three citizen comments. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Gillette, residing at 603 Fleming Way in Yorktown, Virginia, and I have two children in York County Schools. My oldest, Adam, is a rising ninth grader at York, at York High School, and my youngest, Katie, is a rising seventh grader at Yorktown Middle School. I would like to take this time to implore you to bring our children back to the classroom for instruction in the fall, even if only in a hybrid model. The school division's return to school plan places emphasis on two metrics, the level of community transmission and the ability to deliver instruction with operational integrity. As of the last board meeting on July 23rd, the superintendent recommended that students return to school in a remote only model based primarily on a determination by the Peninsula Health District that our transmission rate was substantial using eight data points. While I've been unable to locate any of the relevant data points on the Peninsula Health District website, according to the Virginia Department of Health data and using Eastern Region as a proxy for the Peninsula Health District as needed, every one of those data points has shown a decrease. The ability to, to deliver instruction with operational integrity presents a problem common to every organization in the country. Please stop hiding behind vaguely referenced protests of unnamed staff and the challenges of returning parents to work while their school-aged children must stay at home. Find a way to creatively solve the problem. I expect our school division leadership, which is the reason many of us moved to York County, to be able to overcome these obstacles, particularly given the substantial funding made available from the federal government to provide PPE and disinfecting supplies to make the schools safe. Lastly, I would like to express my extreme disappointment in the apparent lack of respect our school board has to the parents of our community. We made our opinion about reopening schools with in-person instruction quite clear in a survey sent out earlier this summer, and again during the public comments period just prior to the last board meeting. Instead, you voted to defy the wishes of your constituents, hiding behind muddy metrics from the Peninsula Health District and the purported protests of many parents who chose not to make public statements, but seemingly came out in droves to express their concerns privately to the superintendent. Our children need to be in school, 
not only for instruction, but for social interaction, exercise, and a sense of psychological normalcy. I urge you to return our children to school this fall for in-person instruction. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sabrina Hall, and my address is 118 Rockmore Lane, Yorktown. I would like to suggest that the school provides recorded lessons online and flexible schedules so that families can apply the lessons to their home schedule. Families are now playing the role of supervisors of their children's learning, and the teachers are providing the information and education. Therefore, schools should provide that information and education, and households should be able to apply it into their home schedules when they see fit. As it is now, you are trying to run a traditional school bell schedule inside families' homes. This does not work. Parents are having to quit jobs or hire nannies so that they have an in-person helper over their children's online computer school schedule. If lessons were recorded, parents would have the flexibility to do school in the afternoon or evening when they get home from work. Currently, moms of multiple kids are having to provide different lunch times for their children in their own homes because that's the online schedule the school is telling them to run. So in short, provide recorded lessons and flexible teacher check-ins and let the families apply this to their own household schedule. Thank you. Hi, this is Sarah Gillette, 603 Fleming Way, Yorktown, Virginia. Good afternoon. Given the recent decreases in COVID cases and an overall improvement in all relevant metrics, it would behoove the board to revisit the return to school plan. Specifically, they should once again discuss getting these kids back to in-person learning starting with the first day of school on September 8th. Every single metric has improved dramatically. I'm sure you have looked at the numbers, and so I'm not going to bore you with a rehash. I will say, though, that the analysis of the metrics, at least as far as it has been communicated by YCSB, is far from perfect and riddled with inconsistencies. For example, YCSD is using what is the rate of COVID-19 outbreaks as a metric. VDH defines an outbreak as the occurrence of more cases of disease than expected and is designated that only two cases are needed to qualify as an outbreak. Also, using a number rather than a percentage of population to define an outbreak defies common sense. If a group of 10 people are in a long-term care facility, 10 cases, 100%, has a different implication than 10 cases in a group of 100, 10%. We should not be relying on faulty metrics to make decisions of this magnitude. Another example of a misguided metric is, what is the rate of current confirmed COVID-19 ICU hospitalizations? First, the number of confirmed ICU hospitalizations due to COVID is hardly relevant for determining whether or not a public school system should open. If you are trying to decide whether or not to hold an AARP convention, that might be important data to have, but it's not that important for a population that has experienced an essentially 0% hospitalization rate. Second, the VHHA doesn't even have that data posted. They only have the number of confirmed hospitalizations, not specifically ICU. Not to mention, for several of the data points, there is no timeline to determine if a rate is increasing or decreasing. And even if we have that information, it is not necessarily germane to the discussion. For example, one of the metrics is how many hospitals are reporting trouble acquiring PPE and is the number increasing or decreasing. That particular number has been consistently low, yet when it goes from zero to one, then that counts as an increase. Are these metrics weighted somehow to account for the fact that they are inherently flawed? Regarding the operational integrity of YCSD, the website states when the demand can meet the supply, the division can offer the desired learning model. You have not provided any usable information regarding supply or, just as important, demand. Please provide the results of the surveys or commitment forms to ascertain the ability of YCSD staff to report for duty. More importantly, some of the students have opted for virtual Virginia instead of flexible framework. Therefore, they don't need to be counted as students who would report for in-person learning. How many students are going to be using virtual Virginia? While you might not have an exact number, you certainly have an idea. Is it five or 500? You will inevitably have to be able to extrapolate some information based upon what you know right now. Otherwise, you will be paralyzed by indecision. There are parents who, even if they've agreed to the flexible framework in theory, will in reality not send their children to school, even if in-person learning is in Okay, we thank everyone for their comments and their participation.
in the board meeting. And now we're gonna move on to comments by board members. So I'm gonna start with Ms. Geralt's, if you're ready, if you have anything. I'm always ready. <laughs> Okay. Uh, first of all, um, I just want to say thank you to our division staff for all the hard work they're putting in. I know it's um, a lot of days, a lot of hours, a lot of evenings, a lot of weekends. Um, I also want to say thank you for listening to the feedback um, and making it possible for those that are on flex and on virtual to be able to have their homeschool teachers and have all classes offered. Um, I think that's just a really um, great example of how you guys have listened to that feedback and I just really appreciate that. Um, I just want to say something to all of my teacher, admin, and all the school staff um, that are working to get ready. I love you. I appreciate you. I know you're having to reinvent how you do things, and I know it's hard. Um, but one thing I do know is um, the magic is going to happen with you guys, um, with those that are in the school and those that are working. Um, I know with 100% certainty that um, you want these kids to succeed, and you're going to do everything it takes. So I just want to say we're behind you, and we appreciate you. Um, to families, we're going to have some hiccups. We've always had hiccups when school started. Um, it's going to be the same in this virtual world. And um, so just, again, I implore everybody to just be patient and show grace and just be kind with your words, both in person and online, um, and that we're all going to get through this together. And um, I just really look forward to the end of the hiccups and just kind of seeing the great things that our teachers and our staff are doing, because I just think it's really going to be amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Geralt. Uh, Mr. Higginbotham, share comments. Uh, yes, I'd like to reiterate what uh, you said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Chairman Richardson, and what uh, Ms. Geralt's just said about thanking uh, Dr. Shandor and your staff, the, um, you know, the countless hours that you guys have put into uh, gathering data and putting together the reopening plans and uh, then redoing things that were uh, uh, originally thought of with some of those reopening plans, probably seven, eight, nine, who knows how many times. And I'm sure you'll be working on some, some edits as we uh, go with these next couple weeks. So I want to thank you, all, all of your staff, the 12 month employees who have been working for this, all of the parents and uh, community members who are in those focus groups who put the time to work together to, uh, to figure out how we can best um, uh, create a, a situation where students can be successful in the classrooms. And I just appreciate the leadership that uh, was shown and, and all that hard work. Um, some of that hard work, you know, teachers are already doing right now. Um, I've seen on, on social media and things like that, all these teachers who uh, working on their, their Canvas uh, classrooms and coming up with lessons and sharing ideas and plans with uh, fellow teachers, both in York County District and other districts, some districts that have already returned to school virtually and, and they're learning what things work uh, by some of those teachers uh, who have already gone in. And um, the if there's a group of people who are going to figure something out, uh, teachers are, are that group, one of those groups of people I'm going to put at the top of the list that they're always going to uh, do everything they can. They're used to being pushed around and, and kicked down and they always get back up and they dust themselves off and they figure out a way to be better because of it. So I know that the teachers that are working so hard and all the staff members are, are uh, creating ways for students to feel comfortable and to feel connected to the school community, even though we're having to start uh, totally different than we ever have uh, before. And I also want to send a, a thank you out to the families and parents who are working together with the teachers and the students so that they can be successful. Um, you know, it takes a village uh, to raise the students and in York County, we are one big strong village and I just appreciate everyone. Uh, having an open mind and working, uh, working together so that our students can be successful, so that the teachers can be successful. And we will move past this. It just will take time and it'll be in our rear view mirror, but we will be stronger because of it. So I just wanted to share that and uh, thank everybody for their hard work and good luck as we start up in the next couple of days. All right. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Uh, Mr. Mayan. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Higginbotham and uh, Mrs. Garrell. So those are, you know, eloquent comments. I'm just going to piggyback real quick as we approach the first day of school. I know we're all looking very forward to welcoming back our students and families, as well as uh, our dedicated teachers and staff. And despite the challenges presented by the pandemic, uh, our virtual reopening, um, as has been highlighted, is an important next step as uh, we await uh, a safe return to the classroom. 
And although our educators know this very well, the pandemic has served to, to reinforce again the critical importance um, of our schools to the overall health and well being of our community. Um, and in addition, um, again, as uh, was mentioned, I'd like to just gently remind everyone that we continue to need uh, your cooperation and your full support as we continue to move forward and mark progress. And there is now a not so subtle shift between all the efforts at the division level for planning and replanning. Obviously, they will continue to focus on um, re-entering the physical buildings, but uh, again, a not so subtle shift now to our uh, school teams and our teachers and staff uh, on the ground in the building um, to, uh, or as we uh, uh, make or enter uh, the virtual classroom. So uh, best of luck to everybody. We're so looking forward to, uh, to the opening and first days of school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maya and Mr. Schaefer. Yes, I'd like to uh, just thank the entire division I'm talking, uh, from the school board office to the principals, uh, to the teachers, to the parents, to the parents uh, that I have been talking to a lot of people and the uh, general consensus is positive that uh, progress is going to be made and that the best work will be done that can be done. And uh, I implore the, the parents to be to be patient with us as we uh, work through it because this isn't like back in the spring when we sent home packets. This is going to be true school. Um, also, the, the teachers, uh, I have, as you know, I'm married to a teacher and she has been busy all summer communicating with her team and uh, and trying to get things straight for the, the first day of school. As a matter of fact, uh, I was up at uh, Waller Mill yesterday helping to move some teachers from one room to the other as they uh, were going to different classes and different grades in order to accommodate the, uh, uh, the growth of certain segments of their population. And everyone generally has been, has been very good about uh, being positive. And that's what it's gonna take. I mean, it's a lot easier to go in with a positive attitude and get things done and done right than it is to be a negative right off the bat. And I have never experienced that out of the, the staff or the students in your county. And I don't think we'll ever see it uh, this time either. Dr. Shandor, I know that, uh, that running the, uh, uh, trying to hit a moving target the whole time since last February has been very tough. And uh, the school board office, I mean, they work tirelessly all spring and all summer trying to get stuff straight for us. And I definitely appreciate all their hard work and all the plans that were made and had to be remade and remade again. Uh, but they did a great job. And so I just thank everyone for their efforts. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schaefer. And I just want to mention, uh, Mr. Schaefer, your connection is um, is a little slow. It's not the best. Your uh, your video was freezing. Your voice was coming in broken a little bit at times. Um, but just wanted to let you know your connection may not be the best there. So, um, thank you. We'll see what we can do to fix it. Uh, okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, so just a couple comments for me. Um, I did attend a summer academy graduation. We had one student that attended summer academy that was a senior that graduated. Um, so it was easy to do that graduation uh, in person because it was just a, a few people there. Um, but we did have a few meetings, of course, over the summer. I helped host a public forum and comments and questions from citizens on July the 27th. And the York County's Youth Commission um, started and had their orientation um, just this past week, the 18th at the freight shed, and I was able to stop by and uh, say a few comments and meet a few of the uh, 
the new youth commission members. And I'm really excited about the youth commission this year. Uh, they look like a good, vibrant group uh, that may get a lot, a lot of stuff accomplished. Um, so also I was able to, I happen to be at school board office and I'm around quite a bit because it's board chair and you'll see that when you get to be board chair, I'm just letting you know, <laughs> your time's coming. Um, I happened to be up at school board office on August the 20th when the new teachers were during their orientation and was able to at least uh, pop in and, and virtually and say hi to them. 79 new teachers uh, were doing their orientation virtually. Um, so we welcome them to York County. Um, but I'd also like to agree with the other board members and everything they've said um, so far. Uh, we're all on the same page here that we want to thank the parents and we want to thank them for working with us uh, during this time. And we just asked everyone to be patient. I know with social media, we expect things and information right away. And um, it, it's just not right away all the time with, with this. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of different intricate parts that are working together to try to make things work. Um, so just be patient with us and I, we appreciate that. And um, thank you for, for working with us. So now we're gonna move into financial matters. And Mr. Schaefer, would you discuss financial matters at this time? Sure. I hope my connection is uh, going to be better this time. This is a consideration of approval of claim certified for payment. Uh, we have uh, claim certified for payment for the months of June and July 2020. The significant expenses for expenditures for June were instruction related expenditures totaled $175,185 with the largest being New Horizons for uh, special education services. Uh, then we had payments for technology related items, total $1,104,800. Uh, that included the largest payment was the CDW for Chromebooks, software and storage. That was $906,289. There was payments to Sodexo totaling $175,500 for May and June food service operations. Payments related to construction and maintenance product totaled $1,673,683. And most of it went to Heartland for work at the Grafton, at Grafton Complex. Payments for administration totaled approximately $338,100 and included payments to Comerica Bank, uh, which was uh, $241,141 for OPEB trust fund. Then we had total uh, payments for operations total $127,900. The biggest one was uh, to American Paper for $41,658 for floor cleaning products for the whole division. Uh, the significant expenses for July were uh, payments related to instruction were $152,700. Um, that was for in, uh, Instructor Inc. $59,281. So that was for the Canvas and Mastery, Mastery Connect. Payments related to IP uh, totaled $274,114. Uh, and that included, uh, the big one there was X2 development uh, for Aspen and uh, student information system. That was $101,580. Payments to, uh, related to administration totaled $472,094 and included uh, a payment to the Virginia Risk Sharing Association, which was $358,633 for liability, property, and automobile insurance. Uh, payments related to construction and maintenance totaled $305,855, and that included uh, a large payment of $204,927, again to Hartman for work at the Grafton Project. Uh, and significant changes related to the operating budget was for July revenues, local revenue for July 2020 is up by more than 200,000 from uh, July 2019. Uh, and 
past year's summer tuition was collected at schools and later transferred to the SBA, SBO. This summer tuition was collected at the school board office and revenue was recorded immediately. And let's see. Federal revenue for July 2020 is down more than 924,000 when compared to July 2019. This is due to the timing in which impact aid revenue is transferred to the division. For expenditures, expenditures uh, for instruction, IT, operation, and administration and health have increased from July 2019 as a result of the pandemic and one-to-one -one program. Significant changes relating to the food service budget, uh, there wasn't any uh, significant change in, in, in revenue or expenses. Now, the consideration of approval resolution of 2034, a uh, uh, resolution authorizing specific uh, procurement. Resolution 20 34 requires the board's approval authorizing procurements of more than $50,000. There are nine items on the resolution. Two requisitions are for uh, tuition in the New Horizon Regional Education Center for uh, York County School District students to attend a governor's school and career and technical programs. Two requisitions are for IT devices and hardware. Three are for instructional programs to support virtual instruction. And two requisitions our food service supplies. Mr. Chairman, I now uh, move to approve the financial matters as listed. All right, got it. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. And yes, your connection still is a little slow, um, but we, we could understand, I could understand at least what was going on. Um, and you've made a motion to approve the financial matters. Um, is there a second? I'll second. All right, Ms. Second, Ms. Ford. Yes, the motion was made by Mr. Schaefer and seconded by Mrs. Geraltz to approve the financial matters as listed. Mrs. Geraltz? Yes. Mr. Higginbotham? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Myatt? Yes. And Mr. Richardson? Yes. The motion passed five to zero, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. And next we're gonna move into our consent calendar. And is there anything that needs to be pulled from the consent calendar? Has everybody had a chance to look over that? Um, so I'll just go over the list briefly. It's personnel actions, approval of donations in the amount of $2,250 and approval of resolution 20-35, a resolution declaring its intention to reimburse itself from the proceeds of one or more grants made by the Commonwealth of Virginia for certain expenditures made and or to be made in connection with certain capital improvement, uh, capital improvements. And approval of fiscal year 2022 proposed budget calendar and approval of the minutes of a special meetings from July 23rd, 2020 and July 30th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar as listed? I move to approve the consent calendar as listed. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Okay, Ms. Ford. That Mr. Maya, a motion was made by Mr. Higginbotham and seconded by Mr. Maya to approve the consent calendar as listed. Mr. Schaefer? Mr. Maya? Yes. Ms. Geraltz? Yes. Mr. Higginbotham? Yes. And Mr. Richardson? Yes. The motion passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. And for action items, policy discussion, policy first reading and policy second reading, we have none. So we're gonna now move on to the report of the superintendent. So Dr. Shandor, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Again, good evening, board members. Um, this evening for the report of the superintendent, I have asked each of our chief officers, uh, there's four of them to provide uh, some update information related to each of the areas in which they supervise. So. I'm going to ask Mr. Bill Bowen, our Chief Finance Officer, if he could provide that report for Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Uh, Mr. Richardson, members of the board, I have just a few items for the financial report this evening. I um, wanted to remind you that the General Assembly is currently in a special session. Um, a, a couple of things I wanted to bring to your attention um, that's happening in the session. Uh, as part of the special session, there was a reforecast of state revenue. 
And one of the items um, to note is the update on sales tax revenue. And of course, uh, sales tax revenue statewide was reforecast downward. Um, and it's not so much the, the reforecasting, or the amount of money that, that school divisions might lose in sales tax because the way the state funding formula works for education, as sales tax revenue goes down, basic aid uh, revenue goes up, which is general fund revenue. Um, the key here with sales tax and why we monitor it monthly is that sales tax is an indicator of how the economy is doing. And um, certainly um, because K-12 is one of the largest um, uh, sections of the general fund budget, if there's, a, if there's a, a negative impact to the state economy, certainly there's a chance that we could see cuts in funding. So fortunately, we're getting this early snapshot of the state economy. So we... Um, you know, we, we take some precautions and right now it's it's indicating to us that we need to be cautious in our spending, at least until the General Assembly convenes at its regular scheduled session in January. The General Assembly is also considering a number of bills um, related to education and funding. And one, one bill we're following closely is Senate Bill 5069. Um, and this is a bill which would protect, protect school funding related to average daily membership or enrollment. So many school divisions are reporting lower than expected um, enrollment. And this bill would allow school divisions to either claim the higher of average daily membership for either FY21 or the previous year FY20. So that would give us some protection in case our revenue, our, our enrollment didn't meet um, our, our projection for budget. And so we're monitoring enrollment on a daily basis. And as of today's count, we're about 580 students below our projected budget. So um, this does give us cause for concern and that's why we're following that bill real closely. I will tell you, it did get reported out of its first committee, 15-0. So there is some support for that bill. So that's encouraging. Um, but also as a precaution for this potential loss of, of revenue because of the lower student enrollment, uh, we have put a hold on hiring. And Mr. I'm sorry, Dr. Vladu will talk a little bit more in his presentation. The second item I wanted to update on is the te technology reserve fund. Members, you will recall, as we were working on the funding plan for the one-to-one -one program in late spring, the county provided the school division with $1 million in funding from its CARES Act allocation. Well, the county received a second allocation of CARES Act funding, and Mr. Morgan and the Board of Supervisors have agreed to provide the school division with yet another $1 million to support the program. So I want to take a second and thank our partners of the county. This funding will go a long way to support uh, not only the technology fund, but also support our technology needs. And one final item for the financial report. This past Friday, the Department of Education released superintendent's memo providing clarification on fees for technology and payments for device insurance. Staff has asked Ms. Berry for her opinion to determine if our proposed $50 payment for device insurance is valid. So certainly if there is a change um, and it's determined that it's not valid or only part of it's valid, we will certainly communicate that to the YCSD community. And that concludes the financial report this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowen. Uh, and next will be our Chief Human Resource Officer, Dr. Vladu. Mr. Richardson, uh, members of the board and Dr. Shandor, as Mr. Bowen shared, over the past two weeks, our department has monitored enrollment and is making adjustments to staffing. So while I'm providing an in-depth report on class sizes at the October work session, I want to take this opportunity to give you a short update. This year, we have additional scheduling considerations that will result in greater class size variations. Each of our schools must schedule students both in the flexible framework and the virtual academy. As a result, we should expect greater variation in these averages. However, enrollment is down, so it's important to remember that division class size averages should be at or below last year's numbers. As Mr. Bowen shared, we're down a little bit of a, a little bit under 600 students. So the overall class size at division levels again should stay at or be below. Um, our goals. I also want to remind our viewing public that the strategic goal 5.1, even before the scheduling parameters, is related to division averages, not individual classes or schools. As such, despite our best efforts to balance classes, uh, we have classes at below or division averages. So let me give you the parameters. Our aim is to have K-2 classes at 20 to one, 3-5 classes at 25 to one, 
secondary classes, uh, core classes, subject area classes, 29 to one, and secondary English classes for department average or 24 to one. So as such, we may have some K2 classes that may be at 22 or 23 in some instances, because we also have classes that may be at 17 or 18. So as a reminder, I'll provide an in-depth report on class sizes at the October work session. Next, I wanna provide an update on operational integrity. So last Thursday, Dr. Shandor and Dr. Carroll met with Mr. Kevin Pierce, the emergency coordinator for the Peninsula Health District. As you'll remember from the July 30 meeting, the division will work with local health officials to monitor metrics related to infection rates. The division will begin to post this metrics on the website on or around August 31st, and Dr. Carroll will provide an update on this information and into this report that follows. I also want to provide an update related to staffing. Over the past two weeks, we received a high number of requests for leave, ADA accommodations, and telework. The HR department is currently processing these requests. This concludes my report. At this time, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Bladu. Um, we are going to next shift to Dr. Carroll, who is going to share um, items related in operations, and he's got quite a few. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shandor. Members of the board, yes, I'll be talking to you tonight about the health metrics that Dr. Vladu just mentioned, an update on our one-to-one -one status, uh, child care efforts, and then I'm going to invite Dr. Butler, Director of School Administration, to talk about attendance. So as far as the health, health metrics, Dr. Vladu just mentioned the fact that we've been in ongoing conversations with Kevin Pierce, who you met at our last board mem uh, meeting. We, uh, last week, we facilitated a call of all the regional superintendents uh, to get them together for a regular weekly call to help streamline that information uh, corridor with them. As you recall, VDH has created designations for community transmission that have uh, one of four designations based on eight data points. They'll be sharing our status within those four designations uh, from a regional, a peninsula, and a local context, and also the direction of how the transmission is going. That direction will help us when we're approaching uh, de designation thresholds, when we'd be going down from substantial to moderate, let's say, would be the first one we would be hoping for. Now, starting August 31st, we will be posting uh, that status on our webpage in an easy to understand graphic so that those that want to track that information will be able to see that as well as uh, the numbers we have under operational integrity. Those will both, both be posted on the webpage. Second, I'd like to talk to you about uh, computers for the one-to-one -one, uh, program. We have experienced some significant delays in deliveries of those computers, as I've reported to you the last two times that we've met. Uh, this is a national problem that Lenovo, HP, and Dell, the three largest manufacturers, have uh, informed school divisions all over the country that they're having trouble making those delivery dates. And that's due to global demand and also to some issues with uh, federal sanctions on some Chinese suppliers, and we were not immune to that effect. However, tonight I have some good news for you, uh, especially in comparison to other school divisions we've been in contact with that are stating that they're not going to get their devices till October, November, or even as late as 2021. We don't appear to be in that uh, situation, so let me give you our current status. <clears throat> For our kindergarten to first students who will be getting Apple iPads, we took delivery on all of those in the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, those are being processed in-house, getting ready for student use. And we've only got about 100 of those left to, to process. So those will easily be uh, prepared earlier this week. The rest of our elementary units are 300E Chromebooks. Those are for grades two through five. We got a substantial delivery last week, and just this morning, we got the last 912 units. Therefore, all the 300Es are in-house, and those are being processed by our, uh, our vendor for that processing, and those should be ready uh, very soon as we start distribution on Friday. 
Now the Windows 11E units for sixth through 12th grade are a little more difficult to forecast, but more good news as of this morning, we took delivery on 3,500 of those units. That should cover middle school and some. So we believe that we're gonna be able to um, get our uh, K through eight students that are using our devices set up for the first day of school uh, in good order. Now we still need another 2,700 of those Windows devices and we're waiting for some clarification. We're getting updates daily because we're in daily contact with our supplier, making sure that we're staying on them, if you will, and to make sure uh, that uh, we don't get lost in this mix of global demand. So uh, we'll be communicating our distribution uh, in a, in a uh, com communication later tonight. And we hope to get more clarification on high school units as we move on through the week. My third subject is childcare. We know that that is a problem for a lot of families. And so we wanna let you know what we've been doing. We're working with community partners to facilitate as, we, as much as we can to assist our families. And that started with our community partner, YMCA. They have two locations in our county, both in the Tab area and in Williamsburg. Between the two, they have room for about 125 students. The Tab uh, YMCA is full right now, only limited by their ability to staff more. So they're working on that as we speak. Boys and Girls Club is gonna have room for about 60 students and they're mobilizing to be ready for that. And they're ready for people to uh, contact them. We're also working with military base personnel to see if we can support their efforts to set something up, uh, especially at the uh, uh, community ha uh, house down in the Bethel Manor, Manor area. We're waiting to see uh, what they can arrive at and we're there standing ready to assist them in their startup. Champions is our contracted partner for before and after school. And it is opening two locations at Tab Elementary and Magruder Elementary. We're exploring with them ways to expand their offerings and make it more affordable to families. So that uh, we're in that exploration stage, hopefully to have some news for families soon on that. We're also reaching out to additional private childcare facilities to ask them to attend our trainings on our Canvas learning management system so that they can assist students who are uh, attending their facilities and looking to help them with, not with staffing their facilities, but at least in the short term, if we can send some staff out to help them get started so that uh, they're able to uh, have that as part of their program. That's all I had. Uh, I'll take any questions you have before turning it over to Dr. Butler. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. We can go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Butler. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Shandor, I just wanna give an update on attendance. As you know, even though we're not in the traditional brick and mortar, for the delivery method for the first nine week period, the state of Virginia still requires that we take daily attendance because it helps with the truancy law. It also helps with the um, average daily membership or ADM. But more importantly, the state is concerned about the social emotional welfare of students and believe that daily uh, meaningful interactions with students is necessary to make sure that we are gauging the wellness and the engagement of our students. And so in order to make sure that we are following those guidelines, the Department of Education provided a guidance memo back in July to try to give us um, some structures and a method in order to take attendance while meeting all the other regulatory requirements. So we have a task force that's been working on that for the last couple of weeks because we're trying to align our practices and procedures with the guidance, but also maintain the Code of Virginia requirements for daily attendance as well. So we'll be providing that guidance out to our families and to our um, staff in the near future. Um, but again, our biggest concern is making sure that we are having that meaningful interaction on a daily basis with all students. And so because of that, we are having daily attendance and we are working on that currently. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thank you. 
I apologize. Mr. Richardson, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I apologize. Something happened to my screen. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Butler and Dr. Carroll. Our final um, update tonight is from Ms. Skinner, our Chief Academic Officer. Ms. Skinner. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Good evening, members of the board. Tonight, I'm going to give you an update on three topics. The first is virtual academy. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about new teacher orientation and then uh, the the fact that our teachers are returning this week. So I wanna first start with Virtual Academy. I wanna um, begin by thanking our teachers, principals, and my staff for all the work that they've done in helping us to develop a plan for Virtual Academy. And I appreciate the patience of our families as we've worked through this process as well. Today, information went out to our families that had signed up for Virtual Academy. And I'll just give you a synopsis of what information we shared. Um, this virtual academy was developed to support our families who preferred 100% online learning when the division reopened schools for students. We had approximately 2,500 students enroll in virtual academy. Um, in the elementary schools, we are creating separate grade level classrooms within virtual academy. We are going to um, keep as to the extent possible our students together with it as in the excuse me, within their zoned school. Um, there is some possibility that we may have to combine um, some students from different schools together, but we're really trying to limit that to, to no more than two schools. These students will follow the remote learning model schedule uh, when school begins. And then when the division moves into another model within that flexible framework, those students will continue to, ship, to follow their daily remote learning schedule. After the first semester, our parents can change, um, but just, just as an important note to mention is that there is a good possibility that their student schedule would change at that time as well. At the secondary level, our students will take courses with those students enrolled in the flexible framework, and they will follow the remote learning model bell schedule when the school year begins. When the division moves to another model in the flexible framework, those students will continue to be supported virtually by those same teachers in the same classes, and they will follow the same schedule for that model. They will, do, they will be doing that remotely rather than face-to-face -face at that time. Details regarding the secondary virtual academy students' participation in their classes when we move to that model will be forthcoming. Some of the benefits at the secondary level um, is really for our students, it helps maintain their connection to their zone school, their teachers and their peers. It also allows us to offer the, originally course, the original courses that those students signed up for for this school year. Um, just like with our students in the flexible framework, our student schedules will be coming out before the first day of school for all students. So now I'm gonna move into new teacher orientation. Um, Last Thursday, we welcomed 79 new teachers to our school division. And um, we, on Thursday, they received a lot of professional development, a lot of information, helpful information as new employees, HR, health and safety, benefits, technology, um, as well as communication and school administration topics. Today and tomorrow, they will receive quite a bit of instruction on, in the area of instruction. And uh, we actually run seven simultaneous schedules because we really try to tailor new teacher orientation to the unique teacher and what they're teaching. Uh, so some of the things that they'll be doing, uh, they did today and they'll be doing tomorrow include really going and launching into their specific curriculum content that they'll be teaching. They'll be doing those with our coordinators. They receive special education training. They're gonna receive Canvas training uh, as well. And then they will be given some time to go through self-study courses that are on Mastery Connect, effective pedagogy and practices for online teaching, policies and procedures for online learning, internet safety for teachers, um, how to use open educational resources to su supplement instruction. And then they actually have some optional sessions that they can um, talk to our coordinators and our um, innovative coaches as well. And then lastly, I just want to give you an update on our new te our teachers that will be returning on this Wednesday, believe it or not, this Wednesday, all teachers return. And we are planning to give as much time as we possibly can to our teachers to give them um, time to maximize professional development and prepare for this remote learning model. And so they'll be given time to collaborate with their peers, work in PLC meetings, there's going to be time given for training on special 
special education, and then really a large amount of time given to set up their Canvas classrooms. We feel like that's really um, the best way to help prepare our teachers for the coming year. Um, all of our teachers did receive Canvas training before the school year ended, and many attended over the summer additional training on how to use Canvas. And then we have professional development on our division um, initiatives, such as Mastery Connect and curriculum maps, how to do assessments online, um, and then other things such as mindfulness, our social emotional learning frameworks, and um, a, a variety of other topics, as I mentioned earlier, that new teachers will be doing effective pedagogy for online learning. And there's a wide variety of those. And those are actually mentioned in our remote learning plan as well. So we're very excited to welcome back all of our teachers. Um, we feel like we have uh, really done quite a bit of work this summer, making sure that they had the information that they'll need to be successful as they launch into the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Um, before I, I share a couple remarks here to, to finish the superintendent's report, I want to thank um, all four of these, these, uh, these guys and Ms. Skinner, or three of these guys and Ms. Skinner, I should say. Um, they have provided um, excellent leadership throughout uh, the past, obviously, several months, you know, obviously beginning February 3rd with a fire. Um, their ability to problem solve, work together, um, work with our principals, get feedback from, you know, the community, uh, assistant principals, teachers, et cetera, has, they've just done a wonderful job. I can't say enough about, about this team. So appreciate um, the information that you shared this evening. So September 8th, obviously first day of school. And um, you know that first week of school, we're gonna treat it just as we do a typical school year. So essentially, instead of helping kids find their classrooms or work through their, their you know, paper schedules, so to speak, we will focus on having our students logged on appropriately or logged in appropriately, uh, building relationships with them, following their schedule throughout the day, navigating Microsoft Teams and Canvas and getting into the much needed routines that we need. Um, we're gonna teach our students how to seek assistance in this virtual model. Obviously, um, we, we need to have patience with, with everybody throughout this whole situation and show grace as a few more board members mentioned this earlier, this is a new situation for everybody. And we certainly need to have patience as we work through it. I'm confident we have the, the people in place at the schools and, and throughout the division to uh, help our folks navigate the situation. Um, we've, developed, we've also developed online and print resources to support our families and students. Um, additionally, Dr. Carroll is also expanding our help desk hours as well as the personnel in that department. So, Again, we're looking forward to getting our, our all of our teachers back this Wednesday. I know our principals and assistant principals are excited to um, to you know uh, work with their teachers again and preparing for the school year to get our students uh, back uh, back to learning. So thank you so much, school board members, for uh, your patience and support throughout this. And uh, this concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shandor, and your staff. It was a very comprehensive uh, report you had tonight. Thank you very much. So there's a need for us to go into a closed session and I'll ask a board member to make a motion to take us into our first closed session relating to a personnel matter. Uh, yes, I move that the York County School Board convene in closed session to discuss personnel matters relating to the retirement of a specific employee pursuant to the personnel exemption at section 2.2-3711A1 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Is there a second? A second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Maya. Ms. Ford? Yes, a motion was made by Mr. Higginbotham and seconded by Mr. Maya for the school board to convene in closed session to discuss personnel matters. Mr. Schaefer? Mr. Schaefer? He's muted. Okay. Hang on. Yeah. Mr. Maya, I'll come back to him. Mr. Maya? Yes. Mr. Higginbotham? Yes. Ms. Geralt? Yes. Mr. Richardson? Yes. Mr. Schaefer, you there? Yes, I am. Okay, I assume you approve. Yes. The motion passed five to zero. The school board is now gonna go into closed yes. session. Thank you, Ms. Ford. We're gonna take a brief break and reconvene in a closed session. So as a reminder, our next work session is scheduled for Monday, September the 14th, and the location and time will be shared prior to the meeting. Uh, so everyone have a great week, stay safe, and we're now adjourned. Thank you.
So everyone, the live feed will continue here. We will basically be school board meeting in a closed session. School board members, including the uh, attorney, can please exit the Zoom meeting, go into your closed meeting, and then you'll come back here momentarily. Thank you. Thank you, Troy.
We're just waiting on everyone to join the Zoom meeting. I think we're just waiting on Mr. Schaefer to join the meeting and we'll be ready to start. There we have Mr. Schaefer. So the board has come out of closed session and next we need a motion to certify our closed session. I move that we certify the closed session. Thank you, Ms. Geralt. Is there a second? I second. All right, thank you, Mr. Maya and Dr. Shandor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Maya. Yes. Ms. Geraltz. Yes. Mr. Higginbotham. Yes. Mr. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Richardson. Yes. So now the board, uh, we need a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation on the personnel matter that we discussed in closed session. I move to accept the superintendent's recommendation on the personnel matter. Is there a second? Second. Motion was made by Mr. Higginbotham, second by Ms. Geraltz. Ms. Geraltz? Yes. Mr. Myatt? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Higginbotham? Yes. And Mr. Richardson? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes five to zero. Thank you, Dr. Sharendor. And thank you, everyone. And have a great evening. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, all. Take care now. <laughs>